Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for today, Lord. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for just everything that you have done for us, Lord. Lord, I ask that as we uh, dive into Nehemiah 3, Lord, I just ask that you come and you just convict us. You just bring your spirit that we can just learn, we can glean, and we can just draw closer to you, Lord. Lord, I just ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So as you turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 3, we are coming to a place in Nehemiah that is very interesting. It's one of the places that we see a response to Nehemiah's cry. Nehemiah, if you remember, as we've gone through Nehemiah, we've started to see some of those, those things come on, and we watched Nehemiah walk around the city after he was allowed to go to Jerusalem, and he brought some people with him, and he goes to the city, and in Nehemiah 2, he walks around the walls by himself. And as he walked around the walls, he noticed something that was right in front of him, and that was the walls are broken down, they're burnt. It is all destroyed. It is absolutely a mess. Now, when I was looking at this and, and thinking about all these things, one of the things that came to my mind was that as I was looking at a city, I'm not a builder in any way. It's actually not even close to my talent. I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's like if something in my house gets broken, it stays broken because I don't know how to fix it. So I was just imagining myself walking around Jerusalem with burnt down walls going, what in the world do I do? And Nehemiah was a cupbearer. That doesn't mean carpenter. Last time I checked, right? Cupbearer, stonemason, those are different things. And so when he's walking around the walls, I was thinking to myself going, how would I personally be looking at the walls of Jerusalem. And something came to my mind almost immediately, and that was that job would overwhelm me. Right? It would be one of those things that I would look out there and think to myself going, how in the world do I do this? Where do I even start? How can I possibly get this done? And I actually think that that's something that hits us very much in our own hearts because we can often look at a job to do and look at it not in a place of just being overwhelmed like, man, I don't want to do this anymore, but looking at it going, there's no possible way. There's no possible way that Nehemiah by himself could actually complete this task on his own. And this is where it becomes very interesting because now we get to see how Nehemiah relates to us as the church. Because just like Nehemiah looking at the walls the, and going, hey, there's no way I could possibly do this, the church is very much the same way. In fact, here, if you look at the church, we just look at it generally in just one church, like Crossroads Church of Denver. Think about that in, right now, just here. If one person was to do all the things that needed to be done for this church, they would be, we'd find them in the corner. They'd be all shriveled up, right? They'd be like, mumber, uh, like just talking to themselves going, how do I fix this? Right? And it's just an overwhelming job. But then we actually go beyond that and we start to think of the church as a whole and we look at the entire world and we can see the immense work that it takes for the church. Jesus actually told us this in Luke chapter 10, verse 2. I promise we're going to get to Nehemiah, but first we're going to look at Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We see that Jesus right here was saying that, hey, we know that the job is extremely hard. The job is big, and the laborers are few. But Jesus actually keeps on going. If you actually look at the next verse, he says, Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. 
Here Jesus comes in and he tells us that the job is going to be hard. There's not going to be a lot of help. And that it's also going to be dangerous. This is true for Nehemiah. This is true for the church. This is true for our walk with Christ and the kingdom of God. It's a very difficult thing to look at when you look at it from an overwhelmed place. And this is where the children of Israel are. Nehemiah gave them a pep talk, but now they get the chance to walk outside and look around. Have you ever noticed that a pep talk sounds great until you have to get into the work? It's like one of those things, it's like, yeah, we can do it. And then you walk outside and you're like, no, we can't. No one ever wants to admit that, but that's really how often we are. It's actually funny because I came across this quote from Jerome K. Jerome when he said, I like work. It fascinates me. I can sit and look at it for hours. I actually really love that because that's what I would do. I was thinking to myself going out there looking at those walls going, yep, I really wish someone could actually do that. But yet, here is where God is starting to move. Because what God is doing, he's actually going to show us how to do work for the Lord. And he's also going to show us how we come together as one body. We know that it says in 1 Corinthians chapter two, or 12, verse 12, where it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. See, we have the privilege of being in the spot where we get to be that body. And we get to go and do the work of the Lord. I'm not going to lie to you guys right now. It is an extremely difficult chapter, Nehemiah chapter 3. Nehemiah chapter 3 is a chapter that I would deem odious in the Bible. Yes, that is a word I looked up. It is something that I would say, Nehemiah chapter 3 is a long chapter. It's a chapter that has many difficulties in it because we start to simply see them work and work and work. It's something that's hard for us because most of us don't love to do that. D.L. Moody said this. He says, this, he, said, he said this about the church. He says, they have got an idea that the church is a place to rest and to get into a nicely cushioned pew and to cr contribute to the charities, listen to the minister, and to do their share to keep the church out of bankruptcy is all they want. The idea of work for them, actual work in the church, never enters their mind. I read that and I was convicted. I sat back and I was going, wow, how, look at me. Is there many times that I'll sit back and am I willing to do the work? And yet, as I looked at this, I'm going to give us some points of how we are to work for the Lord. And how we are to work for the Lord and do things like not get burnt out. Have you ever been burnt out working for the Lord? I'm going to tell you right now that it happens. But we're going to go over some things that we're going to keep us from that. So in Nehemiah, starting in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and built the sheep's gate. And they consecrated it and hung its doors. And they built it as far as the Tower of the Hundreds. And they consecrated the next tower. We see right here that... The, the priests rise up and they start to build. This is the very first thing that we need to see when it comes to working for the Lord or going into the work of the Lord. And that is the very first thing is we need to rise up. How hard is that for us to do? It's actually pretty difficult. Because remember, they're looking at these built, burnt down walls and everything. And here come the priests right away and they start to rise up and they build the sheep's gate. And we're going to see a lot of these gates. In fact, there's 10 of them that Nehemiah mentions. And we look at them building the sheep's gate and we see something kind of unique. We see that they are building the gate that they would use the most. 
it kind of can come off selfish, right? Here they are. They're seeing the work of the, God, of the Lord, but they're looking at the, the wall, and they're like, you know what gate we really need to build? The sheep's gate. We need to build the gate that is right here that the sheep come into that come in so that they could be sacrificed at the temple. We know that the temple is somewhat built at this time. It's not extravagant, but it's built. But so the priests are looking at it going, that's the spot that I want to work for at the beginning. And this is the second thing we're going to see. This is the second thing that we see right here. And that is oftentimes the thing that we're rising up and see is our calling. The thing that we see that needs to get done is our calling. We can go all robots on them. How many of you guys have seen that old movie, right? But the famous tagline from it is, see a need, fill a need. And that actually goes along with us as the church because there's times that each of us have a different perspective of the church than the other person. So we look at what that person or what's going on in our lives and we see something and we can have this idea of going, oh, I see, I really wish someone would do something about that. I really wish someone would pick up that trash. I really wish someone would have this ministry. I really wish. But realistically, that could be God saying to us, hey, guess what? This is where I want you to move. This is where I want you to work. But we also see what the sheep's gate represents, and that is Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is the lamb. We know that Jesus is our shepherd, but we also know that he was our sacrifice. So when we're working for the Lord, we start right there. And it continues on. It says, next to Eliashib, the men of Jericho built, and next to them... Um, Zachar, the son of Israel, built. And the son, and it goes on with names. Just so you know, there's a lot of names. And we could have an entire Bible study on the names, but I'm not going to. One of the things that it actually comes into the play in this one is this has a lot of names. And we can look at it and sit, think to ourselves of, well, who did what? Who did what? I don't want us to go there. In fact, what I want us to do is I want us to see what they built rather than who built them. Because we can oftentimes put into perspective the people that are doing this is going, look what they have done. Have you ever met a great man or woman of the Lord and been in awe of them? We don't like to admit it. Now, as pastors, we really don't like to admit it. But I'll never forget, there was a time that I, I got to meet Chuck Smith, and I was sitting there, and I was, at, I was at this breakfast with him, and it was kind of an amazing thing. I sat back, and I watched all of us people that were supposed to, you know, bring people to the Lord and whatnot, and they're walking in there, and they're just, like, putting him on this altar of, like, how great he is. And realistically, I, it struck me because it's not the man, it's what God has done through him. But the interesting thing about all these names is none of them are people you've ever heard of before. You're not going to do a word study on the Nehemiah that is listed. That is not the Nehemiah that is named after the book. It's a different one. We're not going to do a word study because the only time his name appears in the Bible is right here. And it kind of tells me that part of it is that as we look at what's going on here, God is basically saying, hey, guess what? Everyone picked up and did something. It didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter what was going on. They just started to work. And yet, they're starting to go around. So what we're actually going to do is instead of go over the names, we're going to go over the gates. And we're going to do a walking tour of the old city of Jerusalem. How many of us want to do that? Right? Walk around all the gates, hang out there and say, this is this gate, this is this gate, this is this gate. This is what we're going to do. So I want you to imagine as we go around, we're going to walk around the gates. And the next one we see is in verse 3. And they built the fish gate. And they laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars in, in verse 3. 
So the next gate, we, we know it, we've seen the sheep's gate, and that was built on Christ. And then we're going to see the next gate, which is the fish gate. The fish gate's actually a very interesting gate because the fish gate is where you get your food. How many of us love food, right? It's one of those gates that I want my house next to so I don't have to drive that far to the market. Be like, hey, yeah, I'm going to be by the fish gate. But the fish gate actually represents something very important to us when we're starting to work for the Lord. And this brings us to our third thing that we want to see, our third point that we want to see. And that is when we start working for the Lord, it's bigger than anything we can imagine. And I'm going to tell you it is always bigger than what you can imagine. Right here as we see the fish gate, there's something that's underlining with it. And that is, we look at a gate that brings in fish. But yet every time we see fish in the Bible, we have to go back and think of, think of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, or 4, verse 19. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 so says, Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So we see that the work of the Lord is beyond anything that we can imagine. It continues to move. It continues to go on. And then as they move on, we're going to skip ahead to verse 5 when it says, Next to them, the Taconites made repairs, but their nobles did not, shoulder to the, did not put their shoulder to the work of their Lord. In verse 5, we're going to get a little bit of a, a tidbit right here, and that is the nobles didn't work with the other people. Now, this is not all the nobles. This is just them of this certain area, this certain city, did not work with their people. We need to actually see here that Nehemiah points this out. God points this out, and the reason I think God points this out is we are not supposed to sit back and expect other people to do what we should do ourselves. There's not a separation here. There's not anything that is bringing us from one point to the other and saying, you guys over there do this, and I'll be over here and do me. But I want to send my servants, and you guys go do that. Because that's what they did. And yet God points it out. It's actually kind of funny because in the work of God, this is the place that we start to get just a little bit tired. When we, we go on and we're like, yes, I'm going to do something. I see my calling. Yes, this is awesome. I have a, a dream. I see. I know it's bigger than anything I can imagine. And I hope other people help me get there. Isn't that fun? I really hope they do it for me. Do you know what? They're not going to. Isn't that, isn't that a fun thing? Because it's the work of the Lord, not the work of the nobles. It's all about the Lord, not the nobles. And yet they didn't have that right here. So as we keep on going, they're building the walls. But then we come in verse 6 to the old gate. The old gate. The old-fashioned one. The one that is of ancient use. What are we supposed to do with the old, what are we supposed to do with the things of the past? You know, when you're working for God, this is actually one of the most relevant questions that we're asked every day. This is a question that I'm asked constantly over and over and over again, and that is, what do you do with the things of the past? And it's actually a very interesting answer because we need them. Notice that this is a gate. We need this to be part of us because the old gate represents the fourth thing, and that is we need to remember our foundation. When you're working for the Lord, you need to remember our foundation. We need to stand where God stood. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, in Jeremiah 6, verse 16, it says, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the way and see, and ask for the old paths. There where the good way is, and walk in it, 
Then you will find rest for your soul, but they said, we will not walk in it. See, the old gate represents as we start moving and walking for the Lord, we need to remember the foundations that we are built upon. Pastor Tom Stipe actually said this. He says, the message of Christ must never change, but the method and delivery system must always adapt to new terrain. This is remembering our foundation. Now, we're not staying there. We're not going to say, hey, just because eight tracks were really cool back in the day, that that's what you buy at the cafe. How many of you guys would buy any of those? Well, I have one. One sold a week. Yes. This will be good. Right? No, it's, that's kind of the whole idea. But the foundation has never changed. So when we're working for the Lord and we're moving out there, we start to see as God moves that we have to remember our foundation and stand on that foundation. And then we keep moving around the city. In verses 7 through 12, we see them start to build and build and build. And they start to build this really long section. It is 1,700 feet. It is huge. But the thing I want us to see right here and just pull out real quick is in verse 12. In verse 12, we see that he works with his daughters. Isn't that a cool thing? Right here, we see that it, working for the Lord is a family affair. Did you know that? This is not a, oh, that's his thing. That's her thing. That's my mom's thing. That's my dad's thing. That's my kid's thing. No, it's a family affair. It's something that we need to really hit on right here. Is that when we go out for the Lord, we are going to get tired if we don't do it with the people we care about. Do you know how much easier it is to walk around when I'm coming home to my wife and she's like, how was church today? And I'm like this. And then the next day she's driving down here with me. It's awesome. But it goes even deeper than that. As a parent, we need to know that when we're working for the Lord to bring our kids into it. What does that look like, though? Because this is where it usually gets kind of fuzzy because you're like, bring my kids into it. Have you met my kids? Right? And realistically, yes, I have. And guess what? You were the same age one day, one, you know, whenever that was. And it's kind of a good thing, but when we're working for the Lord, we can come and take the place where we allow our family to do the work with us, which doesn't mean to do this with your kids. And I please, I beg you not to do this with your kids. Oh, look, this is my son. He can help you lift anything at any time. His job is to be muscle, and that's his only job. You know who doesn't like to be muscle? Anybody. Right? Even the bouncers don't like to be muscle. They're like, I have a brain. Can I do something else? Now, yes, they can help you lift, but include them in the work of God because they're going to give insight in things like that that we don't have. It's interesting because my kids are of a generation called Generation Z. Isn't that a weird generation? I didn't know about it until two, like three weeks ago. I was like looking it up, and then I started to ask questions of how they view life. And it fascinated me of a perspective of the Bible, not that it's different, but of why it relates, and of the church. And it helped me sit there and go, man, this is really cool because I got to see it through a different lens. What was interesting? What worked? What didn't work? And I'm not saying that we're just going to try to reach high schoolers, no. But the whole thing is, is I got to see it from a different viewpoint. And that's the same when my parents came here and all those things. I got to see it as a family affair. So when we do the work of the Lord, it's important to bring our family into it. So we're moving along. And then we come to the valley gate in verse 13. They repaired the valley gate. They built it. They hung its doors and bolts. And, it, uh, and they repaired a thousand cubics of the wall as far as the refuge gate. That is verse 13. Or, they build the valley gate. 
the valley gate actually represents something to us that is a little unique. It represents humility. Because the valley gate is not a spectacular gate. In fact, it's on the ugly side of Jerusalem. Did you know there's an ugly side of a city? Right? We all know what it is of Denver. We usually don't say, hey, look east. We're like, look west to the mountains, how gorgeous it is. Right? This is just who we are. But as you come to Jerusalem, there's a valley gate. And you look over, and it's just kind of a desert. Huh. It's a valley gate. It's kind of a humbling place. So the valley gate is important to us as we can have humility. So the fifth thing is that as we work for the Lord, we need to work with humility. Because without it, we never get to the next gate. And the next gate is vital. Because right here in verse 14, it's everyone's favorite gate. They repair the refuge gate. Now, I'm not going to say what that actually means. We're just going to call it sewage. It is the sewage gate. How many of you guys thought when you work for the Lord, there has to be sewage involved? Right? It's not something you're like, yeah, let's get the sewage going. You know, but here's the big thing, and this is the sixth point that we need to see, and that is we need to stay in a place of repentance, otherwise we're going to be blocked up. Isn't that rough? I think it's a hard thing because that is a place that the refuge gate represents for us. See, when we're working for the Lord, something can happen to us, and that is we cannot bear the fruit of repentance. What we do is we start to, say, to step back and go, I work for the Lord. I don't need to repent. That is for the other people that don't work for the Lord. Well, guess what that means? There is a clog in the pipes, and something needs to break loose, and that is the repentance. In Luke chapter 3, verse 8, it says, therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. We see right here that Jesus is telling us that we need to have this fruit of repentance. It's important for us to be here. I'm going to tell you right now that it's the thing that I want to check myself all the time of going, God, am I repenting? Because there are thoughts in my head as I do the work of the Lord. Because doing the work of the Lord can become odious. Right now, some of you right here are thinking, man, this chapter is odious. This chapter is long. How many more gates are there? This is really boring. You want to know why I know you're thinking that? Because when I was preparing this, I was going, this might be pretty boring. There's honesty for you, right? Because I'm looking at it going, man, the work of the Lord is hard. And we can get there and go, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, but we forget to actually repent. We forget to actually come to a place that we are right here in front of the Lord saying, God, here I am, and I am still a sinner that needs you. But you're using this sinner. You're using this person to work for you. And we get here, and it's still hard. This is the place of burnout. If I was ever to identify a place of burnout, this is it, right here. If you've been working for the Lord, and if this is coming to you, and you're like, man, Craig, you're talking to me. I'm not. It's just God. But if you're being burnt out right now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is the place you're at. And the reason that is, is because up to this point, guess what? All the things have happened. Who is it based on? Us, right? Our own humility, our own repentance, our own works. It's a funny thing in the church because we get to a place that we start to do, do the work of God and we do it in our own strength. And guess what? God will actually let us do a lot of work in our own strength. I promise you he will let you do a lot of work in your own strength. 
And we get there, but then we start to get tired. We start to get worn out. The, the picture of we can do it from World War II just doesn't motivate us anymore. So what do we do when we're tired, when we're burnt out, when it's tough? We come to verse 15. In verse 15, they repair the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, hung its doors, bolts and bars. He repaired the fountain gate. Now, as soon as we hear this, we come to our seventh point, and that is we cannot do the work of the Lord without a little help from a friend. Oh, wait, the Beatles were actually wrong. We need a lot of help from a friend. This is what the fountain gate is. The fountain gate represents the Holy Spirit. See, this is the place that when we're tired, we can actually come and we can rest in the Holy Spirit. How many of us think about resting in the Holy Spirit? Isn't it a beautiful thing? Now, when we think about resting in the Holy Spirit, how do we actually view that? Because usually I think of rest of sitting on a calm beach, right? Just, yeah, the waves coming in, very calm. I'm hanging out and I'm just relaxing. But God's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to tell you how to rest in the Lord. Rest in the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Because in John chapter 7, verse 37. John chapter 7, verse 37. This is what it says. On the last day, that grace day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Spirit has said, out of his heart will flow, river, flow rivers of living water. But that, this, he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jerusalem was not yet glorified. You see right here, the Holy Spirit is a river coming out of you. Now, the word is torrent. Do you know what the word torrent means? So imagine this. Usually we think of river, lazy river, right? Water world, that's where everyone wants to go. God's like, no, how about this? This is going to give you it. It's going to be a bursting spring out of you. Which one's more relaxing? You're like the lazy river. Which one refreshes you quicker? The bursting spring of cold water, right? It's like, woohoo! There I go. I'm coming out. This is good. So right here, we see that as we move forward in working in the Lord, that we need to have this portion, this gate that we're building, this wall that's coming up that comes in and allows us to have a rushing water coming out of us, a rushing river, so that we can be refreshed. Now, when you're refreshed, guess what? You're not tired anymore. You're not burnt out because you just got put out by the river. You are all ready to go. So you're moving forward now in the Holy Spirit, and it's going on. And then in verse 16, we continue just to move forward. And after him, Nehemiah, not Nehemiah, the name after the book, Nehemiah started to build. And then we go through from chapter 17 to verse 25, these beautiful words, after him, after him, after him. And we see something happen. And that is when we're working for the Lord, it is contagious. We start, people start to go, man, that is moving. God's starting to stir up. And we start to see more and more people stepping up and God doing more and more work that we couldn't do on our own. So now we're here and the wall is being built. And as they're looking around, we've seen all these gates built around, all these things happening. And it's really to a point where, guess what? Now we're not done. Now they're looking at the wall going, huh, God, guess what? We could do it. This isn't overwhelming. But yet it's not complete yet. Because in verse 26... They repair 
the water gate towards the east. Next, we get to the water gate. The next thing that we see that we need to know that comes into our place is that even with the Holy Spirit, even with that, that rushing water coming out of us, we can get dehydrated when we work. Did you know that? We can get completely and utterly dehydrated. And the thing that keeps us from getting dehydrated is the word of God or the water of God. So when we start to get dehydrated, we need to stop and actually focus in on the Lord. Focus in on what God has for us, what God wants for us. That is our eighth point, that we need to continue to stay in the word of God. Continue to stay in that water so we are not dehydrated. And then he continues on, and they make repairs to the east, or to the horse gate. In verse 28, he says, beyond the horse gate, the priest made repairs. So right here, we see the horse gate, and I'm actually not going to go into it, I'm going to just tell you the point, because we're going to hit this pretty heavy next week, and that is that when we're, we're building and working for the Lord, we need to be ready and prepared for battle. The horse gate is where the soldiers left to go to war. They would ride out on their horses or their donkeys or whatever they rode out on, and they would go out ready for war. But there's truth in that. We need to be prepared to war, for war and prepare for the battle. But then we come to verse 29, and we get to talk about the east gate. How many of you guys know about the east gate? Do you know the east gate is my favorite gate? The east gate is an interesting gate. Right here in verse 29, we see that, that they made repairs to the east gate, the keepers of the east gate. The east gate is extremely important in all Bible prophecy. Now, we're going to take a little bit of a stop on looking at that and now look at a little bit of Bible prophecy. The east gate in Jerusalem is closed up. Did you know that? If you actually stand and look at the east gate, you see it closed, and you see the Temple Mount right above it. The East Gate is extremely important to us because we need to continue to look east. What do I mean by that? There's an east wind coming, and we need to know about it. The East Gate is important because that's the gate that Jesus brought the glory of the Lord to the temple through. We see that in Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 1 and 2. It says, afterwards, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the glory of the Lord of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. The east gate is where we get to look the east gate is where our deliverance comes from. See, as we look through the horse gate, we know that we're prepared for battles. But as we're prepared for battles, we need to continue to look east. We need to do what it says in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 31. It says, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is in the Lord. See, the east gate represents where our hope comes from. We know that as we work for the Lord, who are we working for? The Lord. We know that we're working for whose glory? His glory. Are we working for our own? Let's take a moment to actually look at that. If I was to tell you that you're going to work so hard that your hands will be bloody, but no one will know you. No one will thank you. No one will even care. They'll treat you like a servant. How many of us would sign up for that? Because it's for the glory of the Lord, right? We're all supposed to say yes, but realistically, when we're working for God, we want to be recognized. 
And it's a really hard thing because as a pastor standing up here, I'm recognized. I'm telling you, I'm getting a lot of my reward right here. But there's times that we're working that we need to know that it's truly only for the Lord. And that's where we're looking for, for his glory alone, not for our own. That is something that we need to hold on to. That's why we need to continue to look to the Lord for his deliverance and his return. Did you know Jesus is going to return? That is a big deal. I'm going to tell you, the day he returns, we're going to be excited. And we're also going to be sitting there probably going, oh, I guess I didn't work that hard, did I? I'm petrified about that notion. That is something that, that I'm worried about. I want to see and look for the Lord and wait for his coming because the east wind is coming, and that is the Lord. And then we get to the recruit gate. Right in verse 31, the recruit gate is our last point. The last gate that comes in there is that more help will come. Remember the first gate that we are, the second gate that we looked into, the fish gate? And I talked about how, how, the fish gate, God is going to take it. It's more than food. He's going to be, make us fishers of men. Now we get to doing all this work. We're looking for the glory of the Lord. Now we stand to the recruiting gate, and more, more people are coming. This is where it starts to get bigger than we could ever imagine. This is where it starts to come together to a place that we get to look to the Lord and say, God, I'm tired. We need more help. And yet God has an answer for that. Because when we're working for the Lord, it's contagious. We'll become fishers of men, but then he'll call on others. He will do the recruiting for us. Because we know that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Which means... As we look out there, each one of us has a responsibility to do the work of the Lord. This is not a place where it's only for the professional Christians. There's no such thing. Just so you know. If you're a Christian, you are a professional Christian because that's your identity. That's who you are. And God wants us to come in there and he wants us to work for his glory. Now, why? Because that really is the question that should come to all of our minds right now. Why in the world should I? Have we ever asked that? Why should you work for the Lord? Why should we make this our life's mission? Because it's so much easier to work for our house. It's so much easier to work for something else. Why should we work for the Lord? Why should we look at it that way? And I'm going to tell you, it's because of his grace and mercy that we work for the Lord. Do you want to be included? Each one of us wants to be included. And God's sitting there going, I'm including you in my work, which is the greatest work we could ever imagine. It's the greatest work that we could ever dream of because it's the work that the Lord has literally put on us. Now, do I know where each one of us is called to work? No, I don't. I'm going to be praying that we, God comes in and shows us. And it comes and says, hey, this is your place. This is the spot that I want you to work. Yes, I have your name. Your name is book, written in the book of life. And the Hebrew people have trouble saying Craig. I can't even go on. That was just a really bad joke. <laughs> no, no, they go on. But our name is written there, and we get to actually work for the Lord. We get to come in, and we get to, to sit there and work for him because it's his glory. You see, God said in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who 
will go for us. Don't you love that verse? Before we read the end of it, let's read that beginning again. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? God asked the question to Isaiah saying, who? And Isaiah has an answer. Then I said, here I am, send me. You see, this is a verse that means something to all of us because this is a verse that God will ask all his kids. He will ask all of us to come to a place of saying, who is willing to do it for me? And my prayer is that we get to answer, here I am, Lord, send me. Because he is amazing. These are the gates. And each one of those gates is how we work for the Lord, is how we are refreshed in the Lord, is how we stand firm in the Lord, is how we don't get sidetracked in the, the work of the Lord. We get to continue in where God has us, where God wants us, where God is putting us in his work. And we get to set up these gates so that we can work for him. But it comes to the last verse. In verse 32, it says, And between the upper room, yes, that upper room, at the corner, as far as the sheep skates, the goldsmith and the merchants made repair. Do you notice where we ended? Where we began. We always begin and end in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the fact that as we come to you, as we come to worship you, as we come to praise you, Lord, that you didn't just make us to be in a boring place, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you designed us, you created us, not just to just be spectators, but to be doers, Lord. To be people that you include in your plan, you include in your will, to include in your design, Lord. Lord, I just pray that for everyone here, that as we walk out of these doors, as we go on our way, as we go through our week, Lord, that we get to ask the question of saying, Lord, what work do you have for me? That we get to answer the question that you have of who you will send, who you will use, Lord, and we can look at you and we can respond by saying, here I am, Lord. Send me. Lord, I ask that you strengthen our hearts. You strengthen who we are so much that we can just rely fully and utterly on you, Lord. And that we can take our place on your wall and in your body. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to stand.